So we're going to continue with Chapter 2 of Summer of the Monkeys by Wilson Rawls. Um, Jay Barry has gone to visit his grandfather at the general store, and his grandfather has told him he knows where those monkeys came from. There was a train crash. And the monkeys, there are 30 of them. 29 of them are worth $2 a piece, but there is a chimp in there that is worth $100. They are coming up with a way, Jay, Barry, and his grandfather, to catch those monkeys. And right now, Jay's grandfather is putting strips of cloth on a trap, which Jay thinks is there to stop the trap from hurting a monkey if it gets caught inside of it. Let's see how his grandfather responds to him. I think he'd know it was on his foot all right, Grandpa said. But once he gets it on... Well, once he gets in it, I don't think there's much he can do about it. After the jaws of the trap had been wrapped, Grandpa unwound the wire from the spring and released it. Holding the trap in his hands and inspecting his work, he grunted and said, It looks like a pretty good job to me. What do you think about it? It looks all right to me, Grandpa, I said. I don't see it how it could ever hurt a monkey's foot. Laying the trap down on the floor, Grandpa mashed the spring down with his foot and set the trigger. Stepping back, he stood for several seconds looking at it, then grinned and said, just to be sure it won't hurt a monkey's paw, I think it should be tested out, don't you? Test it out, I said. How are we going to do that, Grandpa? With a twinkle in his eye and a silly little grin on his face, Grandpa said, The only way I can think is for you to poke your finger in it. I didn't even answer, Grandpa. I didn't have to. My actions spoke for me. Closing both hands, I put them behind me and stepped back. Grandpa grunted and said, <laughs> What's the matter? Don't you think I know what I'm doing? Sure, Grandpa, I said. I think you know what you're doing, all right. But I had my finger in a trap once, and believe me, it hurt. Why couldn't we just poke a stick in it? No, Grandpa said, I the trap and rubbing his nose. It wouldn't do any good to poke a stick in it. We wouldn't know any more than we do now. For several seconds, we both stood there in silence, looking at the trap. Rowdy knew that something was going on and got curious. He eased over and took a look at the trap himself. One look was all he wanted. He started backing up like a crawdad. Then, sticking his tail between his legs, he disappeared behind some boxes. I couldn't help smiling at old Rowdy's actions. He had gotten upon a trap once and had never forgotten it. <clears throat> Grandpa broke the silence by saying, Well, we're not getting anywhere just standing here. It has to be tested out. Now I'm going to poke my finger in it. But if that thing hurts, you might have to help me get it off my finger. Do you understand? I nodded my head and let him know I understood, but I didn't like it at all. Well, here goes, Grandpa said. Closing both eyes, he reached over and tripped the trigger with his finger. The trap snapped and Grandpa jumped. I closed both eyes and gritted my teeth. I didn't open my eyes again till I heard Grandpa chuckling. <laughs> That's just about the best monkey kitchen trap I've ever seen, he said. It didn't hurt a bit. I hardly felt it. All excited, I helped Grandpa get the trap off his finger. Then working together, we wrapped the jaws of the other five traps. Handing the traps to me, Grandpa said, Well, it looks like you're in the monkey kitchen business. Let me know how you come out. I told him I would and thanked him with all my heart for helping me. Calling to Rowdy, I started for home. Just as I reached the door, Grandpa said, Hey! Are you sure your mother didn't want something from the, show, from the store? My heart almost stopped beating. Digging Mama's list from my pocket, I said, Boy, Grandpa, I sure am glad you reminded me. If I had gone home without the things Mama wanted, she'd have made me wear a girl's bonnet for a week. That's what she usually does when I forget something. Taking the list, Grandpa smiled at me. And Grandpa smiled and said, Well, that's what Grandpas are for, isn't it? To look out for boys? I didn't say anything. I didn't have to. My old grandpa knew how I felt about him. Well, grandpa was putting the things mama wanted into a gunny sack. I thought of something. Grandpa, I asked, where am I going to set my traps? I don't know if I'd go right back to where you saw the monkey, he said. If they're not in the bur in that bur oak, they're around there somewhere. Rowdy will find them. <clears throat> On hearing grandpa say his name, Rowdy whined and his tail started fanning the air. Grandpa looked at him and grinned and said, Say that again, partner. I didn't understand you. Do you want something? 
Rowdy really told Grandpa that he wanted something. His deep voice made the tin cans dance on the shelves. Grandpa grunted and walked to the rear of the store. When he came back, he had a meat rind in his hand. Handing it to Rowdy, he smiled and said, Here you are, old fella. That'll be one monkey you owe me. Rowdy pranced out of the store, looking as proud as he did when he had treed a possum. Grandpa asked, Do you think I should use bait when I set my traps? Bait, Grandpa said. Now I hadn't thought of that. Yes, I believe I would. I don't know what monkeys like to eat, I said. What kind of bait would you use? Well, let's see, Grandpa said. I'm not much of an authority on monkeys, but I think I've read somewhere they'll eat most anything. Do you have any apples? We've got a whole barrel of apples, I said. Papa got them from an Arkansas peddler. Fine, Grandpa said. Just set your traps in the dirt at the foot of the tree and hang an apple above each one. I think that'll do the job. Just before Grandpa handed me Mama's groceries, I saw him slip something into the sack. I lit on like I hadn't seen this because I knew what it was. It was a sack of candy for Daisy and me, and it was one item that would never find its way onto Papa's bill. Here you are, Grandpa said, handing me the groceries. The next time you're up this way, I hope to see a sack full of monkeys. Put in my traps in the gunny sack, I said, You will, Grandpa. One of them will be that hundred-dollar monkey. He's the Jasper I want to catch. That's the end of chapter two. So, I know I don't, I've not been saying a lot about the books in these videos, but there is a lot of politically incorrect stuff in this book. So far, we have the, um, of course, white people uh, homesteading on Indian land, which was something that people did. Um, basically how it worked was if you could live on a place for a certain amount of time, the government would give it to you, uh, free of charge. That is what this family is doing. But that is, of course, as they say, this, this is, this is Cherokee land. This is a, it's a territory that, and that land belongs to the Cherokees. So there's, there's one kind of problematic thing there. Um, the second thing I would say is, of course, the uh, the view of guns, which was normal at the time. But you know, Jay Barry talks about um, shooting Indians with guns, which would not at that time have been an issue at all to anybody except the Indian. He probably he probably could have done that and gotten away with it. Um, so yeah, another strike for. I suppose it was the time. Uh, not cool. Finally, um, gender shaming. The mother wants, the mother punishes her son by making him wear a girl's bonnet. Um, I would imagine that was a pretty common thing at the time as well. If you had two children where one was a girl and one was a boy and you probably had to I mean, not had to, but somebody thought it was a good idea to punish one by making them dress as the other. Uh, I don't remember if that comes up again in the story, but I just wanted to comment on that. You, If you watch my Canterbury Tale videos, I let a lot of terrible stuff slide, but because these are specifically videos for younger people, these books I'm reading, I just want to point out Thing, you know, the differences between the 1800s where this book takes place. The book was written in the 1960s, but the... Actually, it might have been written in the 70s. It might be 1971. Let me look. 76 was when this was written. And, of course, the author was uh, named after Woodrow Wilson, um, a good president after his presidency, but not before a, uh, yeah, he's, he was a white supremacist, so, so lots, lots of questionable content, I will, I will continue with the story, but I just wanted to, to put that all out there that I am aware, you can, if you want to have a discussion about it in the comments, you can, but I will see you in the next chapter.